Good morning, everyone. I am excited to welcome you to the final uh, gathering of the Creative Calling Book Club. We are now in week six of six, or session six of six, because we actually took seven weeks to um, wherever you are hailing from today. Why don't you maybe type it into the comments if you're at the creativelive.com slash book club or Creative Live TV, or maybe even Facebook, um, Twitter, Instagram Live, any of those places I would love to see where y'all are coming in from. And right now you might be looking at my face or uh, a window of Zoom participants. And if you're going like, wait a minute, what's going on? And why, why are those people in the Zoom call and I'm not? <laughs> the answer is the easy one. Those folks have signed up to be a part of the text group. Um, that's right. You have my phone number and people are going like, wait a minute, that's bonkers. And I'm, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, and if you want my phone number, pay attention here for a second. I'll give it to you. It's 206-309-5177. Uh, it's a little intimate text group of a few thousand of us. Um, and these folks here in the Zoom call were the first to respond when I uh, asked them if they would like to be in the Zoom call. That's it's maybe a slightly better experience if you're doing that because I can see your face and uh, it's easier for me to call on a human being <clears throat> versus uh, jumping into the chat. But I will be taking questions from both the folks in the Zoom and those of you uh, chatting in from the Creative Live chat from uh, YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, and Periscope. So uh, don't let it slow you down. But one more time, if you want to join that group, it's actually my thumbs. Da -da 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 -da. 206-309-5177. Um, but let's get into it. So we have, um, I promised that this episode today was going to be primarily focused on answering your questions um, with respect to today's, uh, or with respect to creative calling. And it is important that uh, we review just briefly um, the only reading assignment for the last uh, week, it was actually two weeks because we had the holiday here in the States, was to read read this last. Um, and so I'm going to open today's class with uh, a reading from that reading. It's a short one on page 286. And it goes something like this. So many of us live our lives with a nagging sense that something important is missing. We finish school, we build a career, we start a family, buy a house, rent a house, build friendships, do all of the other things that society tells us make for a happy and fulfilling existence. And yet we still don't feel fulfilled. I've come to believe that creative expression is this missing element. Now, creativity is a critical human function. It imbues every incident we experience in life, every sight, every sound, every texture, with profound meaning and without acknowledging and exercising our creativity in small, consistent ways, we are undermining our natural capacity to imagine, design, execute, and amplify the life that we are meant to be living. That to me is a nutshell of this course and the reason that I wrote the book. Never before had I read a book that tied the creative acts that we think about or that we are taught as young people to the craft or the ability to create the living and the life that we want. So this book is, while it's about creative practice and small daily creative skills that will build any individual discipline, the Trojan horse here is this is a book about creating your life. So I hope you've um, gathered that as we've been marching through the last six or seven weeks, six weeks rather, and you know, the, the three topics that I want to cover very quickly before we get into the Q&A are very simple. The first one is that in order to um, in order to get the life that you want, or I will also say in, the, in a sort of small creativity, small C world, the only way that you will create the results that you want out of any individual creative product, project, whether it's an app, a book, a uh, screenplay, making a meal, um, crafting a conversation like this is if you take ownership of creating it. Now, um, it's important that we shift out of this idea that life happens to us 
rather than for us. We really covered a lot about mindset. Oops, someone's got their mic open. I'm hearing a, uh, what is it? There we go. Oh, there we go. It sounds better. Um, it's really important that we shift out of this mindset of you know life happening uh, to us rather than for us. That's one of the reasons in the first uh, couple of parts of the book, we spent so much time talking about mindset. Uh, and I do believe that that, you know, if, as I was uh, scrolling through the comments and the, the texts from the text group, and of course, some of the chat, um, the chat chatter, uh, most of the questions seem to me to be either really, really, really tactical, like, how do I carve out more time for myself, or mindset oriented. So I'm, I'm, increasingly optimistic that I can answer both both the questions at those ends of the spectrum um, in relatively short, concise terms. Uh, but part of the benefit of today's class is going to be not just trying to get through a lot of questions, but when there are things that that don't fall in those easy answers, I'm willing to take them on. And if you're sitting at home right now wondering if my question is valuable or if it's just little old me sitting at my home at home in my underwear in Ohio, um, please ask the question because the chances are of the 4,400 and something people that are in this class, if you have this class, at least, or sorry, if you have this question, at least 10 other people, maybe more have the same one. So um, please do not limit your um, participation out of fear um, out of, uh, anxiety or out of the, the thought that you might, the little question that you have might not be worthy to be heard by the group. So if topic one is the only way that we can get what we want out of this, uh, one precious life or any project is to take ownership for us. <clears throat> topic two is happiness or fulfillment. I like to put those things really close to one another that also is not an accident. You don't get to, you don't get the outcomes that you want. If there are people in the world that you aspire to um, be like or model after or be inspired by, their lives didn't happen by accident, nor do the most happy people in the world, nor do their lives happen by accident. I mean, just think about the kindest person, the most successful person, the happiest person that you know. What is their disposition? Just as a default, what is their disposition? Disposition is joyful. And yet, as we reviewed earlier, uh, the human brain is largely wired for negativity. We have a negativity bias. Therefore, this is job one, controlling this multimillion-year-old organ that is in our skulls. And I, as a reminder, I call it the brain. Not my brain, not our brain. It's the brain. And if you can learn to control the way that the brain talks to the rest of you, if you can observe your thoughts, if you can recognize that there is a negativity bias in your biology, and yet that that thing is wireable, it's programmable with messages that you craft and outcomes and experiences that you craft, how much power would that be for you? That's what this book has been about. How do you take these precious gifts that you've been given and make them into the things that you want to be or become in this world? All right. I do want to take a second here and welcome folks uh, in the chat. We got Sri Lanka in the house. Of course, I didn't get uh, Carrie's like, okay, I'm on my underwear. I'm in my PJs, but she is in Ohio. Um, Ontario, Canada wants to say hi. Thanks out for every shout out to everybody. Um, where else we got? We got more South Africa. Oh, we get some Denmark. Nice. Denmark, London, Florida. Hello, Florida. Peter, Ali, Elaine, Gina, Diane, Carrie, Sky. I want to thank you all for joining. Okay. Um, and our last sort of little review here is the framework. Now, if you have forgotten what we talked about in week one, which would not be, uh, or maybe week two, the intro and or the first uh, section of the book, what we're talking about is an, uh, a framework. 
And I mentioned in that for either first or second broadcast that if I have done one thing poorly in my talking about the book very publicly and my interaction with um, not just the folks here in the Zoom, but everybody who's listening and watching right now, I have done a disservice because I have not hammered into everyone's brain the concept of idea as a framework for life, as a framework for any project. We talk so much, again, that the idea that creativity underpins um, all of our desired success is this idea that, great, but if you don't have a framework for thinking about it, for applying it, for um, if we're taking the actions that need to happen in order to receive these gifts of your creativity, then what have you got? You've just got a bunch of uh, hand waving. And sure, um, the, the book does a very compelling job, I think, of making it exciting and making creativity sound important, uh, as important as it is. But where I've, um, I think, done a, a mediocre job and where I could use your help and where I believe you could use your help is in, in any time you feel lost, any time in this process or in any project you feel lost, go right back to IDEA, I-D-E-A. What is it that I'm imagining? All I need to do is make a plan, design a, a, a structure for my day, week, month, year, whatever the duration of the project is, execute that plan, and then make sure the whole time I'm executing that plan that I'm building audience, that I'm amplifying these ideas. This literally will get you out of jail every time you get stuck. And so I'm trying to commit or rather recommit now that the book's been out for six months. And I want to thank all y'all for supporting the book and for all you've done writing reviews and whatnot at Amazon. I've got some good ones over the course of the past two weeks. Thank you. Um, and if you haven't, uh, it would, would mean the world to me if you did, is to, to continue to come back to the framework. I-D-E-A. And remember, there is a very popular set of problems that go along with the framework or rather our manifestation of it. And that is we do not complete the entire cycle. For those of you who are dreamers or starters, what you're doing is you're just, you're just doing the first two. You're ideating. You get a great vision in your mind. You go out and you buy all the supplies or you get started on your novel. You start writing with great vigor. You design a framework. And then you go right back to dreaming because the executing part is hard or it's frustrating or it's scary. You have a fear of success, a fear of failure. And we all know how much fear drives us. Or you're executing a plan and you're getting people to come along with your, your vision over and over and over again. But what you find out is that the thing that you're executing against and the thing that you're bringing your peers and friends and colleagues at work uh, and in your community along with you on is someone else's big dream. Whether you're working at a company uh, and at your boss's big vision or whether you're working for yourself but really not doing what you were put on this planet to do. In both cases, you are on a path to, um, I think, uh, a, a feeling of disconnection, a feeling of um, wanting a feeling of feeling less than. And that is why I want to just continue to ask you to go back to the whole thing. Have I started out by envisioning the thing that I want in this world? I don't know. Uh, I, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I had a conversation, been doing a lot of the podcasts live, I had a conversation most recently, uh, I think two days ago with Sam Harris. Sam Harris, amazing. Um, you know, I think he's got a PhD in neuroscience, he's a writer very, very smart guy. And we talked at length about our lack of ability to imagine what's possible for ourselves because we're getting hit with so many messages about what's possible that almost by default, so much of our culture has programmed us to be in a, you know, if you, if you are familiar with uh, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, programmed us to be in a fixed mindset because it's, you know, the message that we're fed from our parents, from our career counselors, from the people in our community are um, about possibilities and the possibilities that are available to us are largely what we've seen on TV, what are made popular and all the, you know, blogs and 
social feeds and whatnot. And the reality is that that's not true. Um, and, you know, again, this, this idea of returning back to idea, if we're at either end of that spectrum, whether we're in, you know, just imagining and designing or whether we're living somebody else's dream, I would invite you to return to the entire cycle because that is the way it was. And again, this came from me deconstructing my own successes and failures, the successes and failures of the people who um, I respect, admire, the people who I've spent a lot of time with that are top performers across the industry. It's like industry agnostic. You know, this is from you know Brene Brown and her teaching and talking about um, vulnerability and authenticity or Sir Richard Branson, uh, Damon John, again, all walks of creators, this idea framework was present. All right. Um, I do want to take a second before um, I shift gears and to start taking some of your questions. And I'd like to welcome 82 year old Joanne, who's tuning in from Whitefish, Montana. Joanne, I want to say thank you so much for joining our broadcast today. And for those of you who are, yes, a shout out, look at all the people in the world clapping for you. The fact that you are 82 years old and still willing to take um, control of your life, understand a creative process and apply it is incredibly inspirational. So, so many of us right now are thinking, man, I'm, I'm 32 and I haven't quite done the things I want to be and you're beating yourself up. Um, I, it's just really important to recognize that, um, again, there are, there are folks at every walk of life, every stage that can pick this up and go from wherever you are right now to where you want to be. Um, again, there's a, an example in the book of an artist who got her first show at, I think, 89 years old or maybe 92 and had a retrospective at the Whitney at 101 years old. So it's never too late. And I just want to say, Joanne, thank you for being an inspiration to us all. All right. So I walked you through, again, a reminder that in order to get the things that you want in life, in order to be or become the person that you aspire to be, um, the only choice that we have is to take ownership of it. And this does a couple of things. It reminds us to get out of feeling like a cork in the tide and get into action. Second is that happiness and by extension fulfillment is also not an accident that the kindest the smartest the most successful happiest person what is their disposition it is one of a growth mindset and you may need to overcome negativity to get there the third is keep coming back to the idea framework as a tool all right then um so who would like to share with us their pro and I have a list of challenges that I got. <laughs> I received texts over the course of the past, whatever, uh, two weeks that I can always go to if someone is uh, a little bit too shy to volunteer. But my guess is that I've got some folks here who are willing to share with us uh, a question that they have about the material. Who in the Zoom call? And I might add, hey, NASA, I'm looking at a feed of myself. So in order for me to unmute people, I'm going to need to see a different program feed. I'm going to need to see the Zoom feed. Um, let's see. Who's got a question? I think, is that Thor down there? In the, yep. Okay. Yeah. We're going to go from Thor and then we're going to go up to Marcella. Hey, Chase. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Thanks a lot for finishing the book. And thanks a bunch for starting the workshop because uh, I really needed this help. And uh Happy to do I guess it. the Thanks. question I have, the question I have is, so you printed the business card, Chase Jarvis, mm -hmm. professional photographer. It sat in your billfold for mm -hmm. a year. What was the event that triggered you to finally have face to face with your fear, get it out there and make it, make it, make it known for the first time. The very, very first time that I had, uh, uh, that I, I would say I sold an image was working, I was a ski bum in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. I had just returned from Europe where I traped across, you know, whatever, 27 different countries over the course of the six, seven month period with my then girlfriend, now wife, Kate, learning to, to be a photographer with the camera that had been given to me by my 
grandfather when he passed. I returned to Steamboat and uh, still not desiring a traditional job, still hadn't realized that that was not my path. In fact, I was concurrently applying to graduate schools in philosophy as in a PhD program. And I had recognized that the pictures that I was taking actually had potential. And what I started to do is compare them to the work I saw out there in the world that gave me a little bit of confidence that it was at least like the, the creative gap for me was closing. It wasn't zero, but that my work was actually uh, commercially viable. And what the, the printed business card did was not just something that, that I didn't, uh, it was not just something that stayed in my wallet. And maybe that's a, either uh, I, I, I wrote that incorrectly, or maybe that could be something that you took away from the book that wasn't quite right. But what it gave me permission to do is then in conversations when I would have a, just at, you know, at beers at a friend's house or something, or if I met someone new and they would ask me what I did, I began to, as soon as I printed that business card, use the identity as a photo photographer in my script, not just to myself and not just hidden in my wallet, but publicly. Now, granted, when I say publicly, there was no social media then, and it was not on a stage in front of thousands of people. It was in a one-on-two or one-on-one -on -one or one-on-five conversation. And the mindset of just putting it out in the world, sorry, the mindset followed by the action of simply putting it out in the world that that was my, my if anything, preoccupation. This is what I was thinking about. That is a very, very, that was, that was my step. Okay. And when other people started, because here's how the world, this is why I concurrently believe this is, this is, you know, the whole time you're doing steps one, two, and three, you are amplifying what you're doing. Because if, if you can't bring other people along with your dream, my first $500 and free pair of skis in exchange for a photograph came from someone at one of those parties where I, I told them that I was a photographer my first $500 came from one of those people coming back to me and saying, hey, I work for this ski company. If I gave you a free pair of next year's skis and you could put them on a bunch of your different ski model friends, maybe you could create a good picture for us. So had I not printed that card that said Chase Jarvis photographer, and had I not socialize the fact that what I was focused on in the world was being a photographer. And remember, all you have to do in order to be the noun is do the verb. As soon as I start taking pictures, I am a photographer. As soon as you start building a business, you are an entrepreneur. As soon as you start playing the piano, you are a musician. As soon as you start, you get the point, right? So I had taken those very, very simple steps. And the only thing that allowed that person to come to me with a possible project was that I had socialized those three or four previous steps. I didn't say, Hey, I did this weird thing. I printed a business card. I just said the <laughs> words, I'm a photographer. And, you know, I give you the, 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 the bigger context there because it's important to take these steps. And the most important of those steps is actually putting it out in the world. And to be fair, I'd been working on my craft but without putting it out there in the world, without building community and helping other people understand my vision for myself, none of it would have happened. So I'm going to ask you one particular specific question, Thor, since you asked me one. <clears throat> Where are you stuck? Uh, there's no shortage of ideas. It's, it's endless. <laughs> um, you know, the thing, your stories help me look back in time and realize that some of what I had created in business plans while working with a big company, mm -hmm. um, it's still alive. It just, you know, the, the train is not left. It's actually, yep. it's making sense, right? So mm -hmm. I know what's missing. Um, I'm at a perfect place in life. So it is about taking the doing steps and Taking and, the uh, imperfect, Im imperfect, I can tell for you just by the tone of your voice, Thor, that the imperfect part of action, I'm guessing that you want it to be perfect, that you want, you want it to completely de-risk everything in order to take <laughs> that first step. And printing a business card that says photographer is, a fl is maybe the flimsiest step you can do, right? And I didn't actually do anything right, right, other right, than right. 
put some put some words on a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. But it was action, and I want to know yeah. if yeah. if if you feel like you are clear enough on what three to five imperfect actions that you could take in order to move your vision forward. Do you have you identified three to five things that would get you from where you are to the next step? Yeah. And if I, if I'm face to face with my fear, what I realize is I don't have to be the best in Photoshop, right? There's lots of talent out there. Thank you. So the community is so key to being able to actually not say no, because I don't have the skill, right? Mm -hmm. I can find the, 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 the community to help me actually make it possible. So yes. Um, I don't know how to code, but I know that blockchain is a part of what I want to utilize as a framework to put out there. Um, that's That leads to what actions do I need to take? I need to find people that are in the blockchain community that can help me put my idea into practice. I don't need to learn how to code. I need to find the people. Sure. And you know what else you need to do? You need to start. Yeah, that is that is the you're waiting to be ready to start and you have to start before you're ready. That's just that's just the facts. man. and so if you're saying, oh, I need to meet some other people in the community, I'm going to give you a piece of homework and it is okay. reach out to somewhere between five and ten people who could help you start your vision. It isn't you don't even have to know what happens after that. The first thing is if if the blockchain is really critical to what you want to do or if a photo Photoshop is like, what is the simplest number of action, sim- simplest set of actions that you can take to do something instead of nothing? And to me, that's just open, opening up a dialogue with five people who might be able to help you. Expect to hear no, but start with the possibility of yes and write those people, reach out to them, call them if there are people that you've already identified. What can you do to be in their circle? What can you do to connect with them? How can you do something instead of nothing? Yeah. Copy that. Thank you. Copy. You're welcome. All, All right. right. You guys give a to Thor. And uh, <laughs> Marcella. Hello. Um, Hi, good morning. Good, good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon. Okay, you're yeah, in the I'm east. I'm here on the east coast near Boston. Um, so I think you partially answered my question, but, um, I'm probably going to get some additional input from you and the crew. Mm -hmm. I am a very comfortable introvert, um, and am trying to figure out in this COVID world, Mm -hmm. um, like I'm venturing into art. I run design and construction teams and that's been my like shadow expression but the real expression is not that and how for a profound introvert do we find our community and build our base camp and share um so that's where that's where i'm stuck okay and i want to sorry let me ask a couple of investigative questions if i may so i understand that you manage design and build firms or design and build projects or something but what is your person is that your access, excuse me, under which you want to to put all of your energy to be or become the best version of that? Or is there something you said you you described it as a shadow? Uh, So what is your what is your bright sunlight version of it? Uh, Working with artists and being a mixed media artist myself. So I have a business partner who's on here somewhere. And she and I are trying to figure out businesses to disrupt the art world. But also for me, actually creating art because I uh, come from a long line of artists, but I've always thought like, but I didn't inherit that artistic part. That was for them. Yep. Mm, I love this. I love it. I love it. There's so many, so many, so many um, opportunities for you to make quick progress as I listen to what you're, what you're, what you're saying. So I noticed that you immediately went the, the descriptor, the order of your description of what you wanted to be was first to support other artists and then to become one. Speaking of shadows, what I what I see in that is that there's a shadow of, you know, I am built for supporting artists first. And what I really want to do, but I'm scared to put it first and to prioritize it is to actually be the artist. Now, I could be wrong. 
I've only, <laughs> you know, I've only done this therapy about 60,000 times with different people. I'm happy to be wrong. But if indeed you were alone in the dark, staring at your ceiling at three in the morning, and you said what you really want to do is I'm, notice I'm not trying to take away the supporting other artists. Like I look at what I'm doing right now as that's a part of my vision, right? That's how I started realizing that, man, that's, you know, when I almost died in that avalanche in Alaska, I was like, I'm at the peak of my career and yet something's still missing. And wait a minute, if I got, you know, this has delivered so much value to me that if I could get one or 10 or a hundred other people to tap into a 50th of what I got to experience, it would all be worth it. So I say that as like inspiring and supporting and adding value to others in the creative community is, a, is virtuous in and of itself. But I hear in there that you want to do it. So my question to you is what are you doing? Right? So you're building community is great. I'm also hearing that you want to actually be building community before you starting to do the art part. So I've started the art part. Okay. Um, I get halfway through a project and you, part of it's on the table behind me, part of it's on the floor behind me. And the, you know, the inner voice starts coming in like, what, what are you doing? What, what is this? Maybe you should go see what other people are doing, how they're doing it right before you do this. And that's, you know, then go support artists and create a business. Um, but I get, I start and then. It, it, sounds, it sounds to me to be, it's like it's a fancy uh, virtuous form of procrastination because helping <laughs> others is very <laughs> virtuous. But if you're not putting your own oxygen mask on, you're going to be second class when it comes to helping others. So my prescription, if I may, is I want you to complete five things. And I would challenge you. I think you can actually complete five things in five days if you just set your, you know, set the scope to be something different. It doesn't have to be a piece that's hanging in a gallery waiting to be sold, but it can be a piece that you put in a drawer. And the the prescription to, or rather, I would I would say the solution for getting through this idea of being part way done and tending to the thing that makes us feel good about progress, right? Because if I do something, I get to the point where it's just about to be the part that helps me. And then I set that down and go do something that makes me feel good because this makes me feel bad, right? Almost finished, not quite there. Psychology is saying I need to take a break. And in my, in my break, I'm going to go do the thing that makes me feel good where I can get instant results, where I know I'm you know, I have veracity and I can support others and I can easily tap into a community by Googling, you know, Facebook group uh, needlepoint or whatever your your profession or your your craft is. And you can go start leaving comments. Or that's not bad action. But in your case, you're deferring the completing of creative projects in order to go to the thing that is more natural to you. And so it's sort of like if you're a jump rope superstar and what you really need to be working on is your pull-ups you get a half a pull-up and then you're like cool i'm gonna go jump rope some more because it makes me feel good and what i want you to know is that is absolutely natural 100 percent natural because we all like to feel good about ourselves i'll tell you a little, this is a little insight on creative live creative live has we have two thousand some odd classes and at creative live i've long desired for us to be able to package these classes and to help present the right class to the right person at the right time as you're partway through your journey. But you know, what makes creative live feel really good. is just making more content because it's what we're the best in the world at. And so if we're getting stuck over here, we'll go create five more classes and then the team's high fiving and we get the best, you know, we get citizen cope to do a performance and we get Sam Harris on to do a thing and Brene Brown, you know, we, all right. And then we pat ourselves on the back because that's what we're really good at. But we, what I want us to be better at is presenting the right class to the right person at the right time so that they like bing click this is awesome thank you for helping me that's math that's engineering that's a lot of the you know the very complex side of the business we have mastered making classes sounds like you've mastered helping other people i want you to to master making art and the way that you do that is to complete five things in five days i don't care if you put them in the garage i don't care if you put them under your you know, under your bed, in a drawer, just call them done. Can you do that? Yeah. I, 
I, I really think that the community building to you is that is a second tier of importance. I think you need to start calling yourself the artist first and I also help others. And um, when you do those things and you have some more questions about uh, about building community, I'll answer those after you you know, show up for yourself. And uh, so you can text me, you're in the text community, I recognize your name and you're here in the Zoom call. So when you when you get stuck on the community building part, I'll answer that after you, after, it's, a, it's a, a quid pro quo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, fair yeah. enough? Is that yeah, fair? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna look to the, what is it, Facebook, and I'm going to look at YouTube Live and uh, Twitter and Instagram Live for a couple of comments or a couple of questions here real quick. And then we're gonna go back to the Zoom. Um, let's see here. Where you at? Okay, what's the right question here? Mm. Okay, David Brassity on um, on Twitter or rather Periscope. It's almost a comment, but I want to address it as a question because I think it's it's helpful. And he said he'd love a daily journal, a workbook or something to support this book. I'm in the middle of doing research on um, some projects that will further Creative Calling. Creative Calling's life is still very, very, very young. I think this this is six months into its life. Um, and I think we're just getting started. And I was also scheduled to be speaking all over the world um, about the topic of creativity, both in corporate settings and at the big you know, uh, conferences around the world. Uh, so I want you to know how just show a hands. If I created some more materials around the book, would that be valuable? Just like, a, okay, I'm, I'm putting that at eight, 90%, 85% drew. Nah, doesn't need it. Everybody else does. Um, <laughs> okay. So that's helpful thing one, but thing two, and why I want to, to, um, treat David's comment about wanting a journal as a question um, is because I often get asked, what is the value of a journal? Now, I think the value of the journal uh, comes in lots of different forms. And the most important of which is actually just taking action and regularly revisiting your goals. Um, whether that is in a journal or morning pages or something in your phone that you scribble or look at every day, or whether it's a list of habits or goals that you have. Remember my, my app of choice is Habit List for reviewing my goals and my daily behaviors. But I find that writing um, is A, most powerful for me in the morning, and B, a very good way to organize your thoughts. If you can write down the things that are in your brain onto paper, that is a form of doing two things. One, getting them out of here so that you can use this for thinking and creating rather than remembering. And two, it puts the things in the world from this, this sort of immaterial spiritual, you know, role of neurons and cognition and all these fuzzy things. It puts them into reality. It makes them a hard, reviewable, passable, communicatable thing, which is on paper. And to me, those both of those activities are very, very powerful. So if you do not journal, I'm not judging. I'm currently sort of oscillating between a physical journal and a digital journal as part of an experiment to find out what works best for me uh, so that if I did make some other materials for the book. But to Dave, David's point is that... Um, you know, the, the understanding the value of a journal, even if you are not a writer, even if you are a visual artist, um, the place that I would steer you to is some of the exercises in, um, in the book. Uh, I think it's in chapter in designing a plan. Um, if you review that section, that step, there's a lot in there. Also morning pages, uh, Julia Cameron, um, Tim Ferriss has got a lot of good stuff on journaling. Um, and I am, I'll continue to, to share with you my findings, but if you don't have a, uh, a journal, it's a good thing to do. Also, there was a, 
Uh, oh, and Radana just chimed in on Facebook uh, with the point that I was going to make, which is I had a conversation with uh, Benjamin Hardy, who uh, is an author, just came out with a great book about this. Just look up Benjamin Hardy. All right. So thanks, David, for sharing your comment, which I turned into a question there from uh, from Twitter. All right. We're going back to the Zoom universe. Um, who's brave enough to step up? Who's got a question? All right. Let's see. Boy, um, there's a lot of hands. Okay. We're going to try and I'm going to try and go 50% quicker. And I'm going to start off with Ada Luisa. Good morning. So Good morning. I'm stuck on the execution um, because I've interviewed quite a few people and asked them, what do you feel um, when you want to schedule a professional photographer? What's one of the first things you look for? And then they answer, well, I want to see a professional environment, um, you know, the studio. And immediately I'm thinking, wow, I don't have a studio. So I'm trying to get around to how do I present myself as the professional that I, I know that I am mm -hmm. without this physical building that I'm definitely working on because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm put, I put it out on Craigslist. Hey, okay. give me an hour of your time and I'll, you know, anyway. So I'm just terrified right now. And so I'm stuck there. That's a great question, and I appreciate your uh, willingness to share with us. Thank you. So I find the narratives, like you're probably aware of the concept that statistics can basically tell you anything you want to hear. And so my lens on the petitioning of people and what it is that they want to see when they invest in a professional photographer is gear and equipment is has to do with two things one the uh your it's not it's not um it's not a bad thing to ask the opinion of others but the way that we talk about this in the startup world um i'll use creative live as an example is you got to sell the bananas that are on the cart you can't wait for better bananas and the path to getting the bananas that you want is to sell the ones that you have first. And so in a weird way, what you are, what the universe is providing for you is like, hey, this idea of managing a physical space, there's a whole bunch of stuff of drama and cost and headache and things that get in the way, get in between you and the craft or you and connecting with your subject that you can't even see yet. And as someone who's owned lots of studio spaces and, and, manages a lot of physical physical real estate and relative to being a creator, I can attest that that is true. So to me, what the universe is telling you and what my prescription in your world would be to is to stop asking questions of others, especially ones who um, are, because I'm betting you, you, you have several answers that didn't say I need a physical space to want to invest in a photographer, but you're over indexing on the ones that did say that because you're, you've created a narrative in your head, which is fine. We all do it, myself included. And force yourself to, especially there's a benefit here in a COVID world where out, you know, outside on, in a world where there is no studio, is a, is, a, is a requirement for you to get started. And in, you know, my lens on your challenge is it's, it, we end up making convenient, um, convenient points to ourselves about what we're missing, the distance between where we are and what we need to get started. Um, that is just a form of procrastination. It's very natural. And we also remember have a negativity bias. If I don't have a studio, then and you've already told yourself a story based on gathering data that supports the story in your head. So the, the antidote to this is to do five jobs without a studio or to do 10 jobs without a studio. And one of the parallel um, benefits to a COVID world is real estate is about to be a lot cheaper than it has been <laughs> because people are fleeing physical spaces. So I'm encouraging you to think, to change your mindset towards what can I do with what I have? And if I do these things, the ability to have a studio is 
probably more available to me than ever before. I just have to meet the right people. I have to communicate. I do have to build the community. I have to do all these other things that I talked about. But when you open this conversation with, you know, you're having problems in executing, my understanding of you, you, the problem that you set up was that I can't execute getting a studio. So have you, as another question here, Ada Luisa, have you earned revenue from people without a studio? Um, a couple of people, yes. So, I mean, I'm encouraged there. Uh -huh. So, like you said, it's a narrative. I just, mm -hmm. you know. But I don't, don't I, beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up because we all, anybody have a narrative? Put your hand up. Anybody got a narrative, a story to tell yourself about a thing? Nope. <laughs> Hopefully you don't feel alone now because literally every single yeah. person raised their hand. <laughs> so given every single person raised their hand, don't beat yourself up about a narrative. But what I'm trying to do is great. Get your, put the studio part on hold and go get five paying clients to do an outdoor session. I don't care if they pay you $20 or 200 or 2000 or any other number. Do five without it. Do five at a playground, at a park, at a place where you can operate safely in a COVID world, wherever, whatever part of the planet you're on, and get some money doing it without a studio. Because ironically, when you do it without a studio, you're going to realize that it's possible. And not only does that reframe the problem, but it also is generating money and generating um experience with what you would do with that studio if you did get it and all the while real estate's going to be coming cheaper all the while you're going to be meeting more people who's going to expand your footprint because you might photograph someone that has a spare garage that they would rent or then you might photograph some like this is part of what building community means and we tend to silo these things and i have to solve this problem before i solve this problem and this is why i talk about it as imperfect forward action because right now perfection for you is having a studio the imperfect action is doing what you can with what you have sell the bananas on the cart, do some jobs outside a studio. And then after you've done five of these things or 10 of these things, you might be saying, "Geez, I made like three grand last month. How much is the studio? The studio is two grand. Do I wish I had 2000 less dollars in my pocket right now? These, you start to ask a different set of questions. So don't beat yourself up. Your prescription is to do five jobs without a studio, park the idea of a studio and Evaluate again after you've done the homework. Sounds good. Done. Okay. Done. All right. Everyone, nice job, Ada Luisa. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, awesome. And there's lots of folks raising their hands. Um, as a reminder to those of you in the Zoom group, that Zoom uh, chat is for you. That is, I, I am not paying attention there specifically, so you all can exchange. If there's someone Ada Luisa, maybe you want to go in there and say where you are at, at the risk of getting a studio before I want you to. <laughs> maybe someone on this call has one. Um, but just so you know, I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to the visual side of this and ask questions for people who are raising their hand. Um, let's see then. All right, we're going to go back to... Hi, Kate. Bye, Kate. Sorry, I had to say bye to Kate who's leaving. Um, all right, hands up. Okay, let's see. We're going down to Frank Weaver. Frank Weaver in the lower middle of my screen there. What's up? Frank's now celebrating. And just as a reminder, um, NASA, I don't get to see the second page unless you scroll. I don't have the ability to scroll. I'm still looking at, uh, there we go. I don't have the ability to scroll to that second page. So I would love to, there you go. Um, but I, I, I promised to go to Frank Weaver. So Frank, welcome to the show. Hey, Chase, uh, thank you so much for taking uh, my question. Uh, I'm such a big fan. I'm so thankful for all the content you have been doing through all the years. I remember Happy first watching it. you uh, on the Toy Camera Challenge with Kai. <laughs> and just the way that you interacted with the Kung Fu people uh, was really uh, cool. Thank you. And, Appreciate um, it. That camera, for what it's worth, was 50 times worse than you could ever imagine. And you were it taking some amazing pictures. Too. It looked bad. It was way worse than you think it is. It was very hard. <laughs> it was a very hard subject. And for those of you who don't know what Frank's talking about, uh, Google my name plus Lego camera, and you'll be treated to nine minutes of delight. Go ahead, Frank. Sorry. No, yeah, no, for sure. And uh, you know, I've been following you. Launched Pretty Live, your book, and even your photo session with Apple. You know, I'm a creative pro, so it was really awesome to deliver your session to so many people that came uh, to the Apple Store. 
Awesome. Uh, but my question is, you know, I see uh, the community that you're building. I see these beautiful people that are here, uh, you know, taking your, your teachings about creativity. And that's the biggest struggle for me. You know, I have a podcast when I'm interviewing indigenous leaders talking about conservation. Mm -hmm. And it's great conversations. I had a conversation with a gentleman in Australia that does, you know, beehive uh, rescue. But when cool. I release those podcasts, um, you know, it's just kind of a little bit of crickets. I don't have much engagement with the uh, with the people. So that's my question. You know, okay. How can I turn my podcast into a community like you're doing? I like to make a recommendation to this is a very popular question. This is why 25% of the book was dedicated to building community. So my first prescription would be go read step four again and be really honest with yourself around how many of those actions that are I'm suggesting you undertake in that, um, how many of those suggestions are you actually implementing? So that's thing one. Thing two, in sort of summary of the book, I like to start out by being the fan you wish you had. So I've seen your name in my feeds for a long time, Frank, and I'm grateful. And I'm guessing there are some others. But also show up to people whose podcasts, you know, aren't one of the top ones on iTunes or don't have a million people paying attention to them. People who are in the same line of work as you, if it's in conservation, then show up and post comments on YouTube channels, on Facebook groups, on you become a joiner, join other communities. And if the first thing that you, that you um, post in those communities is, Hey, everybody come look at my podcast. Obviously that's going to feel transactional. On the other hand, if you show up and leave thoughtful comments over and over and over on 10 of the top podcasts in conservation and 10 of the 10 other podcasts on, con on conservation that are just beginning, that are in a similar phase of the journey as you are, those people, if you do it regularly enough, will begin to recognize the name Frank Weaver, and then they will look up Frank Weaver and see who you are and what you're doing. And those will be the first people who come to watch your podcast or listen to your podcast or engage with the community that you're trying to. They will become people in your community especially if you're adding value to them. If, you're, if your comment to them is not just a uh, hands up emoji. If your comment is, this is such a good show, I'm gonna share it with the Facebook group that I'm participating in. Because what does that do to the person who's in your shoes? Let's just flip the script here. You have, you, you post your uh, show I'm just going to say it. it's the place where you can leave comments. So you also post it on, on uh, YouTube and you see someone that said, oh my God, this conversation with this conservationist was amazing. I'm going to go share it on this other community that I'm a part of. If you see that Frank Weaver, you see someone leaves that comment on your page. What do you do? Just would, instinctively be honest. Like, what would you yeah. do if someone said, oh, my God, this is amazing. I'm going to go share it over here. What would you do? I would reply to them and thankful for, uh, you know, leaving that comment. Yep. And I'm also guessing that you'd, you'd look at who, who are they? What's their name? What's their website? What's this other group that they said they were going to share to? Oh, my God. I want to go see how that group is receiving the content that this person shared. And in doing so you are demonstrating exactly what I want you to do. Because if you did that on 10 other podcasts that are popular and 10 other podcasts that are emerging, those, you know, some subset of those 20 people would do the same for your stuff. They would come look, they would, and you would understand exactly, you are the behavior, you are the person that you want to attract. Or if you haven't, then you you identifying your ideal customer. I'm guessing it's someone who likes and does a lot of the things you do, which is why you're building a community around it. And this is a wildly misunderstood thing. You have to be the fan you wish you had. You have to show up for others consistently. And I'm by consistently, I mean months. And I mean every day. If you left a comment on my Instagram feed every single day for two months, I'm absolutely going to know who you are especially if you're first, especially if you have notifications turned on, especially if your comment is thoughtful and if other people like it and vote it up. This is the participation part that most people miss. 
and in me sharing this with you, Frank, and I, I applaud you for asking this question. Um, this is almost ubiquitous in people who have no community and want to build one. The way you build one is by joining others and not just going straight to the transaction of telling them about your community. It's like showing up at a party where you don't know everyone and being the person who runs around telling everyone to come to your party. You're at someone else's party. What world is it? You show up at someone's party, you're a guest of someone else and you start telling them to come to your, I have, I have a party tomorrow or right now I have a party going on. You could leave this party and come to my party. The psychology of that is just like, who does that? The reality is 99 out of 100 people do it on the internet. And then one person who's not doing it, who's showing up, who's attending the party over and over and over and complimenting the guest and bringing, hey, I noticed that you were low on ice last time, so I bought a couple of bags of ice. That's the person that you want to hang out with. That's the person whose party you want to go to when it's appropriate that you introduce that you even are having a party. Capito? Sounds good, Chase. Thank you so much. I think that answer was awesome. I don't yeah. know if anybody else did or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know how that's that's funny. I that's a great question. And Frank, I do thank you. I've seen you in my feeds for years. And um, if anyone was wondering, that's another good reason to turn notifications on, not just for my stuff, um, although I appreciate that. And um like I, I, I mentioned earlier, this is a, I'm, I'm, sh I'm honestly surprised that, um, you know, I mentioned that I was going to read every review and every review has a name to it. And every name is something that I can follow on the internet. Um, just a reminder that like, that's a great example of adding value. Notice I said, it's not just a hands up emoji. No, I, I, it's like literally carrying water. I show up with bags of ice, leaving a review, a thoughtful comment, signing up for an email newsletter, commenting on the newsletter. These are all things that add value to the creator, which in turn inspire others to do the same for you. So I'm, I'm, I'm again, the, the reviews that I have received from this community make my heart sing and they are helpful in spreading this message. But if you want to get on my radar, this, that's a very good way to do it. Um, okay. Comments are going nuts over here in the, uh, in the zoom chat. Uh, I'm going to check out my note over here. Um, Mary Jo, thank you for the shout out. On that. I, I, I really am pleased with that example. I hope. <laughs> nice job, Chase. Andy Katz, Drew, Denise, thank you all for the um, participating over there at Facebook and YouTube Live. Um, we're going to go back to the Zoom call. And who's got a question? Hands up. I'm going to go the going to close my eyes and it's going to go boom. All right. I, just, I see Audrey Hall was the first person who my eyes landed on. Audrey, welcome to the show. How can I help or how can this community help? Audrey, I got to unmute you. Uh oh, put that closer to the camera. <laughs> I have the producer's screen up. There you go. For some reason, I have the producer's screen. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why. It's okay. Just go up so there I'm and click it. Like up. emails up. and stuff go by. Okay. Go in the upper oh, right hand sorry. corner. That's okay. So I, Maybe somebody I, else's. Go for it, Audrey. Here I am. I have a question about mentorship. Um, I've found some really, really incredible mentors to help me in sort of a, um, a career transition. Mm -hmm. And the one thing, they're, they're amazing with helping hone the craft, mm -hmm. but it's in an area of creativity where there's a lot of negativity. So it's sort of, it's like, while they're helping me hone the craft, there's also a narrative going on of like, you shouldn't do this, or you can only do this if you've been doing this for 30 years, because everybody who's successful has, you know, started when they were 12. Yep. You know, I'm not 12, obviously. <laughs> And, um, and that the whole idea of any kind of success is sort of, it's like non-existent. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm trying to figure out like who to emulate 
in in the whole emulation yep. part of it. And it's been really hard to find because I find this narrative sort of ubiquitous throughout the whole uh, area of creativity that I'm exploring. Great. Um, I like this question a lot because um, you're using the framework. And to those of you who um, might not remember, it was from an earlier uh, earlier episode of this class, an earlier lesson on this class. She's talking about emulating under the DEAR framework, D-E-A-R, um, which is deconstruct the lives and successes and workings of other people that you really admire, emulate what they're doing, analyze which of those actions that you emulated are actually helping you, and then repeat those actions. And so for me, that meant going to Barnes and Noble because I couldn't afford to buy a $3 magazine, standing in front of the magazine rack, looking at all my favorite photographers, looking at where they shot, who they shot with, what kinds of pictures, how they were framed, literally taking notes. So I had like notebooks that were larger than the magazines that I was looking full of notes. And then I went and replicated those things. I went to those locations. I tried to contact those athletes. I tried to make photographs that looked like the, the photographs of my heroes. And then some of that started to gel with me and some of it didn't. And I I looked at what was working, what wasn't, and repeated those actions. And that's what helped me understand. So she's talking about a framework that I am very fond of, which is sort of learning how to learn. And in the analyzation part, that's also your, your understanding a little bit more about you. You're, you're looking at other people, but you're starting to understand how you work. And so I think that's a really important and often misunderstood relationship. And whether this is a virtual mentorship, for me, mentorship, it's like mentorship. This is mentorship at scale, right? This is, you're, you get in Chase's brain. This is, you know, 25 years of me as a professional creator, everything I know, horror stories, wins, losses, et cetera. The same is true for just looking at any individual piece of art. You can probably take something away from that, even if it's just a brushstroke. So I find value there. Now, the um, let me just run a little exercise. And, and if you are familiar with the book, as familiar as you might be at this point, then this will be a dead giveaway as soon as I say it. But for those of you who are, you know, maybe you dropped in a little bit late. I want to look, I want you to look around the room right now for green things. Look around the room to, and count how many green things you see. I'm going to give us 10 seconds to do it. Just look around. Just look for green things. Watermelon. Look very closely for green things. How many do you see? Okay. How many red things did you see? Green. No, how many red things did you see? How Not green. And the point of this exercise is that you see what you're looking for. Okay. Uh -huh. So when you're seeking mentorship and the mentors are all giving you a certain piece of feedback, you are sourcing mentors that ex are most likely to give you the feedback that you're looking for. This is not dissimilar to Ada Luisa's point where she's, when she's petitioning people, what do you need in a professional photographer? She's latched on that professional photographer equals studio. And when I ask people, if that's the thing, if that's item number 64 in their list of shit that they look for in a professional, she's going to put it right to the top because that's what she's looking for. And the same is true when I asked you to look for green things. And then I asked you, how many red things did you see? So with mentorship, um, part of what is interesting with mentorship is, and I think this is, um, this is tied to so many things in our culture. Uh, I have realized this is really important in racial inequality. For example, I've, I've been doing a lot of work in that area as a leader, um, looking for ways to help, to learn, to um, just participate, to be a supporter, an ally. And this the one phrase has been uh, very prominent, which is it's it's hard to be what you can't see. So we look for mentors. And if we don't see mentors that are either doing the things that we want to be or they look like us or that we believe we could tap into some aspect of what it is that they are, they stand for, or that they're doing, 
it, it, I understand it makes it hard. And I've learned a lot about um, how, how that manifests. I think it's true across a, a, var- a variety of spectra. And the way that I like to prescribe a solution here is, is this person someone that is then it sounds to me like the mentors that you're choosing, and I'm putting those in air quotes just in case they are default and you're not really choosing them. And those mentors, I think you might want to get some different mentors because the mentors that I looked to did not confirm all of the biases in the industry. Now I'm going to tell you another little expanded story that is actually part of what helped me understand the, what I could become is when I looked at the photo industry, I did not see anyone sharing information. I did not see anyone who was um, willing to reveal their secrets, their trade secrets and build community around those shared holes in our knowledge. So I used to do all of those things. I did, you know, I, I told you the story about standing in front of the magazine rack, but what I didn't see is anyone talking about all the hard stuff, all the shoots that sucked and where they missed and where, so that was in deconstructing, analyzing and repeating or emulating, analyzing, repeating. I was emulating the thing that the things that were working, but I also used it as an opportunity to say, okay, I'm pretty familiar with the marketplace. I've been doing this research for a long time and there's a gap. You start to understand where the gaps are and whether this is a gap in mentorship or a gap in opportunity for a business or a gap in opportunity for your art or to say what you want to say, um, you can then start to exploit. And I use that word in the positive sense as in take advantage of, make use of those opportunities. So the shortest version I can give you, Audrey, is try and get some other mentors who are actually living the thing that you find is needed. And if you're telling me they're not out there, I think you're not looking hard enough because I think if you can look at it, like there is a community, there is a community on the internet that paints portraits of dead presidents and sells them on Tuesday for a hundred grand. There is a, there is a face, there might just be 12 people in the world that 7 billion people that do that, but there's a community out there. So I encourage you to learn, look a little harder. And then thing two, reality is you're not going to find a mentor who does exactly what you want. And that's the magic. That's where you, you get to put your imprint on that. And if, the mentor serves two thirds of your needs and that what they don't serve or fulfill in you is this positive, like, Hey, it, you don't have to have 30 years of experience. You can start doing this tomorrow. Then th- that's a great thing for you to experiment with. I loved, like, let me give you one other example. And I like to use my own experiences because it's something I can speak as absolutely honestly and without, without um, projecting on onto others. So my experience was, Every person, every photographer, every, when I talked to them about how to become a professional, included in the prescription to work for another photographer, assist other photographers. I do not think that is bad advice. I think that is actually good advice because you get to be around it. My dumb ass didn't do that. I went from, I never assisted for a single day in my life as a photographer extremely rare, extraordinarily rare, but that ended up being my own path. Right. And so this is where I think you, as a, as a mentor, when you look at mentors out there, no mentor is going to build the entire picture. There's always going to be some that is mute. It's gray. It's blurry. It's fuzzy. That is an opportunity for you to dive into that area, explore it. And so when everyone said that I had to do that, I was like, okay, great. Um, that sounds slower that I would want to do this. <laughs> and so that was the the way that I was able to, um, you know, I guess become the mentor that I never had. And, you know, I'm not telling people that they have to be an assistant. I'm saying now is a time where the gatekeepers are more invisible and removed than ever before. So hell with it. I'm going to go for it. Now, long answer, but again, I think the, 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 the multifaceted aspect of your question that you're doing the prescription, you're deering it, D-E-A-R, you're seeking mentorship, you're not seeing the things you want in the world. It's a complex 
problem that has a very simple solution. At the heart of it is action, right? Action over intellect. I said that lots of times in the book. And I hope that you've now, you're, you know, 30% further along than you were before you walked in. Any follow-up questions real quick, Audrey, before we move on? No, that's great. Thank you so much. Super helpful. <sighs> Who's on fire today, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Audrey. Go get them. Thanks so much, Chase. Happy right. to do it. Happy to do it. It brings me so much joy. I can't even tell you. Mm. Good to see you. Likewise. All right, all right, all right. A lot of people raising their hands. Let's go back. Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Sorry, it's so hard when every like literally everyone raised their hand. So um, I couldn't tell if let's go with Happy Man France. Hi, Happy Man France. Good morning, or I'm, I'm guessing if you're actually in France, it is probably uh, well into the evening. Are you unmuted? We got to get Happy Man France unmuted here. Nas, so I'm still looking at the. Uh, I, I have the wrong page up that I so I can't click on them myself. That would I need you to do that. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Hello. Okay. Oh, Franco. Happy Man, oh, was, Happy the, Man the text Franco. was so small. The text right. was so small. And now I see right. the Franco part. Just like the spaghetti. <laughs> well, I have um, one comment <clears throat> and one question. And Great. The comment is uh, earlier this morning, I was watching your creative uh, calling class mm -hmm. on Creative Live. And during the first one, um, a guy named Josh got up. Okay. And he had said that he had made a mission statement and that had helped him a lot. Mm -hmm. And then you went into core values and how that those two things can help you find out what your calling really is. And I thought that was uh, spectacular. It really. Thank you. Well. It's it a great framework. The, my question is, I'm stuck between a starter and a noodler. Okay. I can start a project. I love nature. So I do uh, landscape flowers with macros. I don't do people and I don't do people basically because I think I'm a perfectionist and I know I won't get it right. So I shy away from doing people. Okay. But what I find is I belong to the 52 frames on, uh, on the uh, web mm -hmm. and I look at the photos and I submit mine and I find out how much better everybody else's photo is except mine. And I try to learn their things. So I'm, I'm spinning in circles, if you know what I mean. I do. I do. What is your What is your ultimate goal? What is your ultimate aspiration? Um, to master the landscape and um, flowers. And okay. basically when you say master it, do you do you do you want to sell them, or you just want to take them and put them in a drawer? Do you want to display them? Or do you want to sell? I them? want to sell them. What I did <clears throat> before we came to came out here was I would um, print my photos, put them on a wood board. Mm -hmm. Mod Podge them, and then my plan is to go back. When I go back to Maryland, is to sell them at craft shows. Okay, cool. Notice the difference between when I ask what's your ultimate goal, and then what you just told me. You you talked about mastery, and yeah. then when I said no, 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 that like okay, so once you've mastered something and you put all these photos in the drawer and you don't show them to anybody, you don't talk about it, that got you to something that was slightly different, which is no, no, no. I actually want to make money from my craft. I want to, and so I think. Uh, inherent in that, and we all have something to learn for you. So thank you for volunteering again, happy man, uh, is be really clear about your goals. Because right now, the spinning part for you is you are working on your craft, you compare your work to others, and then you go back to working on your craft and you compare your work to others and you go back to working on your craft and you compare your work to others with what if you actually priced something appropriate, you took your best work and you went to a fair tomorrow? Could you sell something for $10? Could you sell something for $100? Definitely. Okay. And if your real goal is to be selling photographs for a living, part of that is selling. And why you are a starter and a neutral, you, you are doing the imagining and designing. And then you're going back to imagine and then you're designing. And you're going back to imagine. It's like my craft could be a little bit better. I posted my photos. Nobody liked them. My craft could be a little bit better. When you're really, your real goal is to make a plan to take a photograph, mount it, 
you know, design you know, to, to imagine yourself as selling photographs for a living. The first step is in that process to sell a photograph. So this is what, I, this is the I, mm -hmm. I'm imagining myself doing this. How does one do that? What would the plan look like? Well, it would be to take a lot of photographs and then look at those thousand photographs and print my favorite 10 and then take those 10 to a fair, any fair, price them not to make me rich, but to actually transact and get used to that. Mm -hmm. so then you go execute that plan. And the whole time you're doing it, you're handing out business cards. You're telling people in your 52 frames group that you've got a show. You are passing out business cards at the, sh at the fair or wherever it is that you want to see it. You're, uh -huh. you're executing this plan and notice you're amplifying. You're talking to a lot of other people. And I want to give you a shout out for volunteering your story here. Thank you. This is a great example of building community. Uh -huh. And if you did that tomorrow, I bet of the thousand photographs you have and you did, you printed 10 and you took 10 to a craft fair and sold them for 10 bucks each mounted mm -hmm. on wood or whatever might even be break even might might even lose money mm -hmm. you would actually recognize you're like damn i just did my thing i thought i was so far away from my goal mm -hmm. and right under my nose were the 10 photographs that someone would pay ten dollars for and once you've completed that entire idea this is a uh -huh. beautiful example of what I started earlier in the broadcast with ID and EAs not completing mm -hmm. the whole thing. And notice you couldn't do that because your original question, my original question to you is, what do you want to do? You're like, I want to master it. The concept of mastery is just about craft and perfection and craft and perfection okay. versus selling mm -hmm. something, which is we find out if we push just one layer deeper. That's why being real with what we want in, in the world about imagining a solution is actually a super critical piece of the puzzle that we often zoom right over because we say, I kind of want to be good-ish with the camera-ish and sell some photos and no, 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 laser focus. And once you've done the laser focus and you mm -hmm. walk through all four of those steps of the process and you complete that process and you're looking around and going, damn, I did it. And maybe you only did it once and maybe you only did it for 10 bucks. Mm -hmm. Once you've done it once, it's repeatable. Right. I'm that example with $500 and a free pair of skis. I sold a photograph and it was like, I was like, I could die and go to heaven at that point. <laughs> and then all yeah. I did was do the same thing again. What did I do? What part of that worked? What was the hard part? What would I change if I had to do over again? and repeated. And then my next sale, I did the same. And my next sale was the same. And with every sale, I could then walk into a, uh, when I, when I approached the merchandising manager at RAI and said, notice the photos on the wall, I've got a portfolio full of these images. I would love to show them to you. And she said, okay, well, what mm -hmm. else have you done? Like, oh, I've, I've, you know, licensed some images to some ski companies. Most of the work that I do is outdoors instant credibility because I'd actually done the thing once go back to Ada Luis's point or any of the other guests that we've had on before. Like once you've done it once and you've built a little confidence and you can actually share that that's people want to hear that you've done the work before photographers rarely get hired for work they haven't done. Right. And the same is true across any creative. If you haven't built a house, how many yeah. homeowners are going to hire you to build your next house? Right. Mm -hmm. So you need to find a way. And that first one is the hardest, which is why I'm trying to get you a win. So I'm guessing if you want to do a little bit more work on your portfolio, fine. If you feel like you got one or two heaters in a, out of the 10,000 photos that you take, print those, go to the, go to the, uh, the fair that you aspire to sell at in Maryland, sell a picture. And if you don't sell one and you sit there for four weekends in a row, you're going to be talking to a lot of people. You're going to be amplifying. Yeah. And you're going to be learning what is the gap between your pictures and what people actually want to pay for. Mm -hmm. Copy that, Franco. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm very happy. I'm excited for you. And I see you just turned 70, right? Yes, I did. And I'm retired, so I can do this. <laughs> nice one. I love hearing it. Congratulations. Let's give a shout out to Happy Man Franco. Thank you. Word up. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to shift gears here, take a peek at all of the different feeds we've got going on right there. Cool, cool comment here from Diane. Mentors are fine, but reminder, you control 
your own learning curve. This is true. So many of us have a, you know, lean on our mentors to give us the answers. This is the cool thing about deciding what you actually want to do. Despite it, you being embarrassed or ashamed or weirded out by actually saying that you want to do something and that the world might not approve of when you actually start doing that thing, learning takes on a whole nother meaning because hungering and acquiring knowledge actually becomes a huge benefit. It's a huge win if you learn a skill and you're like, dang, I can do that now versus pushing a rock up a hill, which is what learning always felt like to, like to me in school. And as soon as I started saying, no, I want to learn photography, I would like be the dude at the library where the librarian would have to come up and say, uh, the library has been closed for like 20 minutes. I want to go home. Are you going to check out the book or that's what learning feels like when you're actually learning things that you want to be doing. So be honest with yourself. Great reminder from Diane. Um, Harriet just says, I recognized, I just realized rather how much she's downplayed her own success. I think that is a wonderful takeaway. You have successes in the world, even if they're small. And you have achieved a couple of things in the area that you are interested in, even if they're small. The mindset shift to finding what is positive rather than engaging our negativity bias, our crocodile brain, the well-worn um, neurological pathways that tell us that we're not enough. Recognizing the positivity, it, the, the things that you have actually accomplished is so valuable. Thanks for reminding me of that, Harriet. Um, I'm going to take a question from Diane. And she says, I've enjoyed your pot. I think it's a question. Mm. No, it's just a comment. So thank you, Diane. It was a long comment. I needed to read it. I thought it for sure it was a question buried in there. All right. Thank you. And um, Denise, hey, uh, Happy man, Franco. Denise Yields wants you to know that she she wishes you a happy 70th. Congrats. Um, okay, back to Zoom. Where you at? Raised hands. Lauren Kelly was first. Lauren Kelsey, rather, was first. I know you've already asked a question on this show before. I remember. Nice to have you back. You were like lightning. It was like this. It was just <laughs> I don't always reward speed, but uh, thanks for being on the show and welcome again. Excited to hear your question. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I hope it's a good question uh, and that other people can relate. But um, when I read the book and listened to the book, um, one of those things that I really related to was your story about what you mentioned a little bit today as well about kind of jumping the line or, or progressing really quickly and bypassing mm -hmm. people or, or going outside of the norms yeah. track that the old school or older generation um, thought that you should be following. And um, I've really been doing that in my work. Um, I'm the one that works in film um, that we talked a couple weeks ago. And mm -hmm. uh, I've jumped up the ladder like exceptionally fast and I've just gotten a new gig that's even higher and higher. And um, I feel really concerned because I get it a lot from the older generation that I'm like ambitious as in like a negative way yep. and um, that I have trouble surrounding myself with people that are super supportive of me kind of going my own way, but I can't yep. always choose because I'm working in a film production situation. So I can't surround myself always with super supportive people. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had any advice of how to sort of deal with the haters I, or the negative people. I that do. I do. <laughs> First, uh, allow me to, um, well, thank you for sharing your challenge. First, let me make a light wispy joke. You're sounds like you're in Canada. Yes. <laughs> Canada and ambition. Like, I don't know. So <laughs> y'all are very, I, I'm just kidding. There's, I, I love Canada's one of my favorite places on the planet. And, uh, of course, Canadians are known for their humility. So <laughs> um, uh, jokes aside, the you will always get pressure from um, outside. And go back to this negativity bias that we're wired to pay attention to. If we get 100 positive comments and three negative ones, everyone over indexes on the negative ones. And that's natural. So what you need to do in a case, I'll just take the most simple version of the comments is to 
if you have chosen to read them, just recognize that you are likely never going to be criticized by people who are um, more imaginative or who've actually done the hard work where you will be criticized as people by who, whom have not or are um, either growing or you're dying and these people are probably on a downward descent. So if you look at the source of those criticisms or in Brene Brown's terminology, if they are not, or Roosevelt rather, if they are not in the arena, then it's your duty to get good at what to pay attention to and what not to. Now, if these people are people that you generally respect and they are you know, providing you with their opinion, analyzing their opinion for the value that you can extract from it is important, um, or maybe there's an opportunity in there, but conditioning yourself to by and large continue to listen to your gut and focus on the things that are out there in the world that you want and people that are out there in the world that are setting an example that you choose to follow conditioning yourself to orient around that and not the other thing is a very important job. If you ask the writer Elizabeth Gilbert what her job is, she says her job is her mental health. She's a writer second to that. Her number one job is taking care of her head and her heart. And whether that feels squishy to you or not, it is required, especially if you are, um, you know what? It's not, not, I'm not even going to qualify it. it is required. Full stop. So in the case of doing things that are out of the norm, and I will, again, I try and turn to my own experience because in an almost a, a Buddhist way, like all we have is truly have is our own experience. Um, and I can project and guess about a lot of other people, but I'll tell you, I had the same exact thing happen because I never assisted a for uh, another photographer for a day, because I went from zero to, um, you know, making money as a photographer extraordinarily quickly. Um, there's, op there's often opportunities for those who decide that following the, per the prescribed path isn't as valuable. For me, I had a benefit, which is I was just ignorant. <laughs> it's, not like I, it's not like I chose to do this other thing. I didn't know how to do it until well after I had already done it. And there's so it's sort of like there's bliss and, and ignorance. And yet, if I, if I um, looked on any photographic forums early on in my work where I was building community, the reviews would be mixed. It was a very, very mixed bag. If you can condition your mindset not to get... Um, pulled down by those who are the haters and if you can orient your mindset around people who inspire and encourage um, this occasionally ends up meaning you need a different set of friends and that's part of what's hard you you you, you if you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with and four of those are telling you that you're not doing it right getting a new set of friends even if that set of friends is in a different are in a different industry could be valuable. And that's not to say you don't want to have connections to your industry. You don't want to remain sort of connected to or a part of that community. But orienting around, you know, the five people who you spend the most time with, keeping them in the, you know, the positive camp is, is I think, very, very important. Remember, Brene Brown makes a list of people that she actually wants to make sure that she is in line with their opinion of her. And then that list, I think she says it has five people on it. That's a very small list. And, you know, like in internet language, checks list, not on list, don't care about you. <laughs> like not don't care about your opinion or okay, like in, in, the, in the lightweight sense, I might care about you as an, another human being, but I don't care about your opinion of me. So this is, this doesn't happen by accident. This like so many other things in our world or our, in our human conditioning is something that it's a muscle that we develop. So practicing that muscle and when I get negative feedback or when I get things that want to check my ambition, checks list, not on list. Thank you for your opinion. Next. So one other, um, 
related bit, which is, is two thoughts. And this is, I don't really have a crisp delivery on this, so bear with me for a second. But what I'm feeling is that people who, and I'm again, I'm trying to rely on my own experience here, there, I, I used that as a talking point when I talked to others or the people that were in my innermost circle as a, um, I didn't realize it at first, but it acted as a little bit of an anchor because it, it became a talk track for me that I went to. I'm growing quickly in my industry. I blah, 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 but all these folks. And what I realized at some point was in use, in, in articulating that. Now this is, I want to be very careful because I, I want to reward you for bringing this up, but I want you to put a pin in this and I do not want you to, um, I want you to move beyond it because I found that as a, it became a default talk track for me that I was being held down by these other people. And once you start to say that more than one or three or five times, it's a talk track. And that talk track ends up acting as an anchor. And again, I, I apologize for this not being very eloquent, but I think you're picking up what I'm putting down oh, I because totally I, <laughs> okay. I also remember that you said this a couple of weeks ago. There was, there wasn't the whole thing, but it was a piece of that that shared a similar sentiment. So I can't make this assumption because we've only talked twice, but if this is true for you, that you said this more than five times and it's not serving you, I need you to put it down. And anytime you end up in that talk track, say these words for yourself to yourself. That's not like me to use that framework. Next time I'm going to, and whatever the behavior you want, that's not like me to use this thing. It's not serving me. Next time I'm going to find five people that I really respect and admire and don't check my ambition or that support my goals. I like to put it in the positive. It's a very simple phrase that I learned from a sports psychologist when I was 15 years old. If I made a bad pass in a soccer game, rather than saying, oh, God, you're just like, that's not like me next time. I'm going to hit him right on the run or whatever the thing is. And just, it was just automatic. And it began to rewire, like your brain is plastic, right? Your brain is, brain is moldable. These default neural networks, we end up in a rut and this rut is a talk track. How many people find yourself at a party saying the same thing you said at the last party over and over again? about your profession, about your skills, about your vision, about who you are, about what you do. We are creatures of habit that makes it comfortable for us. We don't have to think. We don't, and all of those things, if again, going back to, and I, I, I acknowledge Buddhism, not because I'm Buddhist, because I think it's very, very useful. It's about presence. Buddhism is about presence, being in the present moment. And the minute you're in the past or the minute you're projecting into the future, you're not right now, all those things are forms of suffering. Mm -hmm. The story that you told yourself about your coworker not supporting your ambition, that is you suffering. And again, pain in this life, completely not optional. Everyone will have pain. Suffering, that is beating yourself up about a thing, telling yourself a narrative, holding yourself back, all that's optional. Because if you're truly living in the moment, you cannot be, you can't do those other things. Mm -hmm. So, <sighs> Vito, we good? <laughs> Lauren? Yeah, we're great. It makes a lot of sense. I think um, letting go of it all is, it can be a challenge not to replay it. I don't think it's a story I say out loud to other people very often. I only, I ask you because I feel like you've been through the yeah. very similar thing, but I've 100%. definitely been replaying what people have said to me in the past few years, yep. people that I admire in mm -hmm. some form of my career. And it's really, it is time to let it go, I guess, but that's, it's a hard one. <laughs> it, is a, it is a hard one. And when you hang up, you're going to go, great, I got my path, but it's not easy. Remember, sure. simple, not easy. Yeah. Very, very simple. I'm saying that's, that script doesn't serve you. Let it go. And how you let it go is by using that little mantra mm -hmm. and by actually directing your thoughts to something that, act, that serves you or a community that serves you or people that serve you or a vision for your own precious life that serves you, whatever the fact is. And I also, I want to say, I'm not suggesting that you are, you've, you verbalize this 
Sure. Because remember, the most important words in the world are the ones that we say to ourselves. So even if there are things that all y'all, I'm just pointing to all y'all on the screen here, even if you don't verbalize them, but you think them, th that's every bit as, as uh, potentially harmful. Now, verb thinking it and verbalizing it and getting stuck in that talk track, that's, that's doubly hard because you're thinking it and you're doing it. <laughs> and so you've got the corresponding action, which is continuing to wire your neural network. And again, I, I don't want to get too much into neuroscience here um, because at the, the, at the, on the, on the most simple and surface level, this is just about, again, the words you, the words you use language is very important. And if something's not serving, you need to choose different words. And if a thought's not serving you, you need to be able to direct this organ. It works for you. You do not work for it. Your thoughts are not you. If you meditate, you actually get good at looking at your thoughts. My goal in meditation is to not think. My goal is to focus on a mantra. And I meditated this morning. I'm 10 seconds into my meditation. Thought comes around. Oh, geez, I wonder where my USB, my mini USB cord is. I'm not even kidding. This actually happened. And then I'm like, oh, this is not time to think about my mini USB cord. This is time to focus on the mantra. Thought, not chase. Thought goes by. See you later, thought. Mantra, mantra, mantra. Oh, my God. Am I going to have time to eat before the broadcast? Not serving me. My goal is the mantra. Thought goes by. Notice I am not my thoughts. You can either be in the waterfall or you can look at the waterfall. These start to, this is why I meditate. Again, this is very, I'm getting like some of you are like scratching your head right now. Like, whoa, he's going deep. But th this is why meditation becomes powerful because it serves so many different aspects of you. You start to realize that you are not your thoughts. You start to realize what it, what calmness looks like, what being in service of yourself, what self-care, all these, there's, there's a bazillion benefits. Anyway, thank you, Lauren Kelsey. Shout out to Lauren for volunteering her challenge that we all share. Who? All right, we. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go at this for another 18 minutes. Um, Mary Jo Needles Needles Doris wants you to know, Lauren, go get them. Um, the uh, either Kate or Nasa, whoever's running uh, our social channels right now creative live wants me to share my mantra um the mantra that i use in my tm is given to me and it's not something that i share um the mantra that i think is effective when you're being criticized or when you make a mistake is that's not like me next time i will with the behavior that you desire mm -mm. all right all right let's see Mm -mm. Muriel, your screen is frozen. Uh, hope, hope, uh, other screens are not frozen. Can you guys all move your? Oh yeah, okay, cool. You're moving. It's working. At least the Zoom call is working. Um, cool. I'm gonna go to show of hands. I'm gonna go to Lauren Pennywell. Good morning, Lauren. Hi. And, and then, Aliza, did you have a question or was that, was that a scratch or was that a raise? <laughs> it was a scratch. Okay. I wanted to make sure. Uh, I was trying to, tr trying to choose two folks here. We're going to go to Lauren. We're going to tackle your question head on, Lauren. How can I help? Since you got a little woo-woo with other Lauren, I thought I'd feel comfortable asking this. Great. Um, I'm wondering, I notice in myself, especially being on this Zoom call, how much anxiety I have around being seen in like a big way. Like I feel it in my chest. So I'm making up a story that you don't have that, that you always, you never had a fear of being seen in a big way. And I was just wondering if that's true or if that's something you've acquired along the way. Practice. Practice. It's practice. And it's true. Um, I will share a story from a podcast yet to be released. This is the benefit of being in the little inner circle here in the podcast I'm about to release with Sam Harris uh, sometime in August when he's got a, a new book dropping. Um, he talked about being terrified as a speaker. And yet he wrote a book that was very popular that required he go on book tour. 
like, how do we reconcile these two things? This was in 2004. He talked about this, or he shared this experience about being in 2004. And um, he had a, an experience where he froze and um, paying attention to the physical sensations in the body. This is um, a very, this has much to do with mindfulness. So if anyone wants to take classes around mindfulness, um, my wife, Kate, is a teacher of mindfulness and she has not given me the ability to share her coaching practice with anybody on the call. So at some point when she will, I will share it with you, but there are great mindfulness practices out there. What mindfulness does, it, it gets you out of your head and into your body. And if you start to like, what is fear? Basically fear is generally a story, right? We go boom, right into our head, head tells, head talks about the time that we froze in front of our students. It's a comp, it's a comparison about our worth as a human. It's a versus what Sam shared so eloquently in our podcast. I can't wait for it to come out. But what he shared so eloquently, it was like, great. Now you have this anxiety of being seen. What does it feel like? And as soon as you're going to like, what does it feel like? Where is it in my body? Fe the fear and the anxiety literally can't exist because you're like, okay, what does it sound like? What does it feel like? I don't hear any sounds. It feels like a tightening of the chest, shortness of breath. If you sit with that for like 20 seconds and you're describing it, you're not anxious. Then you're talking about a series of neurochemical reactions in your body that are creating something and you're recognizing that, huh, that's just a chemical in my body and fear all of a sudden starts to feel a lot like excitement, huh? Looks like what I've been telling myself is a story. Now I'm simplifying years of practicing this into a single sentence. So I acknowledge that. But that is a powerful experience for those trying to get over public speaking, trying to get over the fear of putting your work in the world. What does it feel like to read a negative comment? Where do I go? Where does that come up in my body? Stomach, heart, head. Mostly these feelings are from here to here, right? It's from your belly button to your neck. And you're like, okay, sit with that for a little bit. Now, um, let's get out of the neurology for a second, but I, cause I do think it's very much, it, it is the ability to strengthen and condition your neurology is, is an important aspect of it. That is, this is a deeper version of why I prescribe mindfulness or meditation. And it is a thread of most of the top performers in any discipline is their self-awareness and mindfulness. Um, so it's, this is a short. You know, the, that prescription is a shortcut for what we're talking about in a little more depth here. Um, the shortest answer that I can give you about my own experience is um, as a young person, I performed and enjoyed it and not dissimilar to Lauren Kelsey started getting, you know, when you start to be in the fifth, sixth eighth grade range, people start talking to you about, you know, it, it, your ref, people reflect on your personality, who you quote are as you, how you show up in the world. And then we start making judgments about that. Is that accurate? Is it not accurate? Does it make us feel better? Does it make us feel worse? And so to be super fair, like unlistening to that or unlearning what other people have said about you is difficult, but it's literally a matter of repetition. It is a muscle like so many things I'm prescribing. And this is why, this is why it blocks most people because the thought of getting in front of people or this, this is why publishing work is so valuable. If everyone on this call published something every day for 30 days, every day or five out of every seven, at the end of 30 days, you would feel dramatically different about what you put on the world. You would feel, and I'm not just saying a little, I'm saying dramatically different. And it's like going to the gym. How good does it feel the day after your first workout? It feels like shit. This is an emotional hangover. As soon as we pushed publish on our work and someone commented, lame, 
this is t- it's someone that you've never met on the internet took a quarter of a second to tap out L A M E and it is defining your next 24 hours. I'm not saying that that's not human. I'm not saying that that's not natural. I'm not saying that we're not wired for negativity bias. I'm not saying that we have stories about our performance, our capabilities, who we are, who we might be, who others think of us. But I do know that if you did that 30 times in a row, that quarter second that some asshole in Connecticut took to type out four letters does not matter. Now, I, we have, I'll, I'll share a funny story. I was, I think I shared this earlier. I was about to talk in front of somewhere between, let's call it 10,000 people, somewhere between eight and 10,000 people. It was a stadium. It was, I think I'd been hired to, to talk at the Intel annual company meeting. It's literally, it was held at the Staples Center. So I'm going on stage in the Staples Center where the LA Lakers play basketball. And I'm backstage with my wife. And Kate is terrified for me, terrified. And I've got my noise canceling headphones on and I'm like, and the reason is I'm used to speaking in front of large groups. Kate's not. That's it. That's it. It's a muscle. Now, I, it's important to, the last thing I'm going to say is I, it's very important to not devalue the often hard nonlinear process of getting from, you know, where you are now to where you want to be, but it's just a muscle like anything else. Your task, Lauren Pennywell, is to find out how you can put yourself in that environment in a lightweight way over and over and over. If it's public speaking, it's Toastmasters. If it's putting your work in the world, it's publishing every day. And there are 10 other, you know, analogous ways to practice depending on your craft or what it is that you want to be or become in the world. I'm just giving you a couple of obvious ones. So I do think I'm a natural extrovert. I'm becoming more introverted or I would call it ambiverted at later in my life because I feel like I can actually get more work done. I can make more progress on the ideas and the things that I want to be and become in a smaller environment. Um, but it's not required that you're an introvert or an extrovert. Some of the most successful, happy, fulfilled, talented creators in the world are introverts. And yet they show up on the today show that they show up in places that we need to see their work. So it's available to you with a little practice. All right. Now I never got clear. Aliza, did you have a question or was that a, was that a scratch and not a, I was just, no, Mm, you kind of got a question. Yes, I want to hear from you. Hi. Hi. Is it Aliza? Is that right? Yeah, you actually got it right. That's super awesome. <laughs> Good job. I pride myself on my ability to screw up only 20% of the names, but I often screw them up badly. So if I get yours wrong next, whoever's going to be next, I apologize in advance. But for now, we're focused on you and your question, Aliza. Um, it was a scratch, but I don't really... <laughs> <laughs> but since I'm here, I, sh- I feel like I should um, join the conversation. Um, I, I had started a project a few years ago and then life happened. So then I put it on hold mm-hmm. and being in quarantine gave me the opportunity to bring it back to life. Beautiful. So I started actually part time on that, uh, found a full time job remotely as a graphic designer. So like financially, I don't have to stress too much mm-hmm. and I can still do part time on my passion project. And I'm also starting to sell those things. People are sending me great feedback. They're sending me they're like text messages. Thank you. Like, and it's like, I, I feel like I get trapped at that next step. Like I don't have a website. I'm not selling online. Uh, I just post the things that I make on Instagram, but I, even that's rare. And awesome. mm-hmm. so it's always like word of mouth or people contacting me. Like, hey, I just saw you posted that. Are you selling this? And then that's how I make sales. Great. Which is a good thing, a good problem to have. It's just, I think the, it's the next step. I, I, I'm constantly blocking myself there. Cool. Well, I can't wait for you to go rewatch this the next 120 seconds over and over again after we're done recording this class and it's on the Creative Live website because your prescription is very simple. 
you are conveniently accepting where you're at right now, which is fine. And yet embedded in you is a desire to go forward because you've talked about, and again, I'm not prescribing this to you. I'm, I'm just translating the words that you used into what I believe having done this a bunch, you, you mean, which is like, I want to go to the next step. I didn't hear you say that. You just talked about the next step as it's, it's distanced from you. It's over there. So I don't have to go touch it because if I can't accomplish it, it's not mine. I don't have to own it. This is fear of success. This is fear of failure. It's fear of a lot of things. It's all based in fear. And you know what? 100% natural. 100% natural. This is why I'm going to take you back to I imagine. You need to define, take a second and define for yourself what it is that you want to do. Imagine what's possible. And this concept of imagining is a little scary because it sets you up to potentially fail, to potentially miss the target, to potentially not make it to the next step, whatever that means in your world. But here's the cool thing. If you set yourself up and you walk through this four-step process, I believe that the success and fulfillment that you want from this thing that you haven't, that you have some notion of, but you haven't become crisp on, I think you've got it. I think you've got it in you and I think you can do it. The cool thing is that I think like literally every person on this call without exception has the capability to do some version of the thing that they want to be. Now, maybe if you want to play in the NBA and you're 66 years old, maybe you can be an NBA coach. Maybe you can be a trainer on the NBA. Like you can get super, super close. So I'm trying to think of the most unrealistic thing. I don't know a lot of 67 year old NBA players. But there's the ability to be so close. And for almost everything else, you can actually do it. What's required is describing the vision, designing a plan to get there, executing that plan, and all the while building community. So your job starting in 72 hours when this is on the creative website, creative live website, is to go back and watch this two minutes because the prescription is quite simple. I want you to actually write down the things that you want out of this next step. If you could envision a next step, what would it look like? What is a plan that you can through deconstructing the success of other people, trying what works, seeing what, what, what would the plan for you be to reach that? Attack that goal, right? Attack that goal, execute against it. And then all the while be showing up as you are here today and you know what, even if you don't end up doing that thing or your plan varies just a little bit or in any of these situations, you're going to learn a lot. Maybe you're going to refine your eye just a little bit and you're going to you know, tweak your plan a little bit and it's going to be within your reach before you know it. The distance between where you are right now and where you want to be is shorter than you think and this is true for every person. I think you're, you're well on your way. Okay, it's just the next step. You don't have to see all the steps. You don't have to see the whole ladder. It can, it's foggy. There's a jungle between you and where you want to be. All you have to see is the step that's right in front of you and the one after that and the one after that. How are you doing? Thumbs up, down, sideways, up, down, or sideways. Double yeah. thumbs up. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Round of applause. Shout out for Alisa. Awesome. Um, I'm going to take a peek at the other feeds. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Elaine Faber. Maybe it's Alan. Maybe it's Elaine. I just, you know, talked about 20% of the time getting these things wrong and 80% getting them right. I don't know since he's on YouTube live. I'm sorry. Says he's an introvert. Has done 50 videos in 50 days. Shout out. That is, that is a serious amount of work. As someone who knows what goes into making a video. And then here's the punctuating sentence. I can already feel the changes, the challenges and the rewards. So not dissimilar to Eliza, it's not going to all be rewards. You're going to find hard spots, but you're going to find some rewards and some areas of opportunity, some things to, to work on. 50 videos in 50 days. That is serious business right there. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, let's go back to the Zoom. Cool. Oh, Nancy Crow was very fast. You're very fast. And then we're going to go to Henry Travis. 
Nancy Crowell, what's happening? Welcome to the show. Thanks, Chase. Um, you've kind of addressed some of this, but my narrative is worth. Um, before I even launched a photography business, a, a, a five-figure job landed in my lap. Okay. And um, it was a legitimate job, but it turns out it was a person from my past who had known me as a creative person before I did the whole tech thing and mm -hmm. was watching what I was doing. And um, so that was like unexpected success. Mm -hmm. um, now, years later, I haven't matched that because mm -hmm. that sort of reinforced the imposter syndrome, like, mm -hmm. right. Oh, it's someone who knew me. Who hired yep. me. Um, so I have a really good, uh, sort of social following and I will post photos and out of the blue, someone will say, I want that. I have to have that. Yep. And my immediate response is to figure out how to discount my price for them. Great. Um, my favorite thing about this question <laughs> is that the prescription is, it's pretty gangster, but it's very clear. Is there another question? I kind of interrupted you there. So I want to make sure is, no, it, no, is, no, it, is it mostly about pricing? Kind of the crux of my issue here. Okay, cool. So, we're social animals. We want to be accepted into the tribe, even if we're an, an, an introvert, um, belonging connection. Uh, if a baby is not held as a baby, it will not just not turn out well, it will die, especially early on in that child's life. So that just underscores my point about how wired we are biologically for connection and acceptance. And if you take into this conversation all of the stuff we've been talking about mindset and connection and how to tune in or out to lovers or haters of your work i think that's all part of this answer but if we focus on the narrow aspect of two things that you said nancy one early success and then pricing early success is awesome but it's also very hard i can't tell you the number of photographers that i have mentored um both like one-on-one -on -one like eyeball to eyeball having coffee and on the internet who land a job, uh, a, a campaign for Nike and they think they've made it because they went from shooting for their, you know, local magazine. Someone saw it, someone, you know, promoted their work. Someone at an agency who worked for Nike saw it and they got a campaign for Nike. They think that they've made it. And then, you know, the next um, job does not happen for a long time. Um, this is true, you know, they call it the sophomore slump in, you know, in music and with album releases, with so many things. So it's very common. And so on that point, I want you to know that it's common. Early success is, you know, both a blessing and a curse. Um, so importantly, trying to not compare yourself to that first success, which, you know, for, luck is another reason that we get hired, right? It's not all skill and ability um, or wisdom and genius <laughs> there's a lot of the world is a very uncertain place um, so if you can start to deconnect yourself from disconnect yourself from previous successes or failures and get back to the moment like who am i what can i do now right now not yesterday not tomorrow now over and over and over live in the now um, that's step one and then with respect to pricing it's very easy because you have to be willing to a work on how you mention your stuff it, like word for word script. It's sometimes it's easy to write it down. Sometimes it's easier to practice in front of a mirror. It's required that you practice in front of a mirror so you can deliver it. Listen to Vanessa Van Edwards. If you type in Chase Jarvis, Vanessa Van Edwards pricing. I would also encourage you to watch my conversation with Ramit, R-A-M-A-T, Seti, S-E-T-H-I, Vanessa Van Edwards and Ramit, Ramit Seti. And if you go back with Ramit, look at my very first interview with him. If you search me on Google and you look to our, we have a conversation somewhere in the 2012 range, I think maybe 13, 14, talking about pricing. My price is $500 versus, this is Vanessa Van Edwards versus my price is $500. And the points that you'll get from Rami are how much value am I adding? If you are an artist and you are charging hourly, 
I understand why you might be doing that. I think that's the wrong approach because it limits the amount of money that you can make based on time. I like to have a creative fee because a creative fee can be any number. And a lot of photographers get trapped into a day rate. Great, I want you to work for four days. The most you can make then is $8,000 versus I have a creative fee of anything you want it to be based on how much money you know they have, based on how much money they did it for last year, based on that money is on the table for you. So these are very, there, there are very tactical pricing exercises that you can both learn from listening to my conversation with Vanessa and my conversation with Ramit, where we go deep on these things. But ultimately, you have to get really good at a very, very narrow set of things, which is talking about your work and price. I like anchoring it to value. There are some anchor pricing available. There are some anchor pricings available to you in the market. What are other people doing? Like, for example, if you have a video on demand subscription, it's very hard to make that a $200 a month subscription because Netflix is $9. This is, these are realities. But that's why I would like you to then reframe the conversation, which is what, what Ramit talks a lot about, is reframing your pricing around a structure where you can make however much you need in order to make it. And then the delivery of how much your shit costs is practice. I can look someone in the eye and say, yeah, it's, it's going to be 100 grand to hire me for those two days. And some, they may be flabbergasted, but you know what? The difference between getting a hundred grand for something and 10 grand for something is largely who you're talking to. This is why starting to understand where you want to be pricing can tell you who to talk to. Because if you're, if you're happy man, Franco, and you go to, you know, the street fair in Baltimore and you say, you know, my woodblock portrait there is, or my woodblock block landscape is a hundred grand. Do people who show up at a street fair expect to pay hundred grand for a photograph? No. But if that photo is on display at Sotheby's, do people at Sotheby's expect to pay hundred grand for a photograph? Yes. Who's the difference there? What's the difference? The work is the same. The difference is the audience. So if you know where you want to be in the market and you decide who your customer is and you can shop it to them, that's going to help you. Ver Notice how this is intentional. This is not who fucking called me and wants to buy a thing. This is who is my customer? Yeah. Very different. And for those whose ears I offended, it's not a, not a, I'm not known for not speaking like that. So I apologize in advance, but it's also well chosen. And in, in, in um, speaking of intentional, it's intentional because most of you need to wake up to this. If you are just responding to who calls you, you are not driving your business. Okay, this is super critical. If you want to make a living, then, you know, again, selling something for $5 on the internet, how many things you need to sell to pay rent? Right. A lot. This is simple calculus. This is simple math. If you want to, now, there's all kinds of narratives about how much, how long you've have to been in the art world, how many experiences you have to have had. Who do you know that buys shit for a hundred grand? Might need to make a new set of friends, might make me to put yourself in a different place, might need to swim your client base upstream a little bit, might need to get some referrals, might need to, there's a lots of things you can do, but as soon as you start defining some of these unknowns, you get really crisp really quickly. Whew. I got one more question and then I'm going to go get outside. All right. Who wants it? I think that I, did I pick two? I think I did. I went to Henry Travis, right? I said, Nancy, and then I said, Henry. So Henry, we're going to you and your fantastic bookshelf behind you. I'm going to uh, unmute you. There we go. Ask you to unmute. Oh uh, yeah. The soccer ball and Tim Ferriss. Yeah, of course. Right. Uh, I see it. Take, yeah. Thank you for taking my question. Happy and uh, I'm going to iterate what I saw in chat, which was, can't believe this is the last session. I really appreciate your time. And uh, we've been taking notes like crazy. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the kind, the kind words. I'm really loving it. I want to have a couple for a couple Saturday mornings to, uh, to, to get outside. This was my normal Saturday morning is when I'm, I'm humping out. Um, but I'm also, I feel really connected to you all. Um, I've seen so many familiar names and, and met so many new folks through the course of this. And 
uh, our texting relationship that I'm trying to find more ways to do this. So keep your eyes peered uh, to my feeds because we're going to do more, but I've, I'm getting a ton of juice from this too. So thank you for that and, and stay tuned for more. Um, in the meantime, how can I help? So uh, I finished reading the book this week. And one of the things that I thought was most profound was when you said that enthusiasm is more powerful than confidence. And I, when I reflected on my experiences in the past, I saw a strong correlation with when I was enthusiastic about something and when I was successful. So that really kind of struck home with me. And awesome. my question for you is probably pretty straightforward is uh, when you're being offered all these different gigs and you can basically pick whatever you want to work on at this point. Uh, and there are a lot of good ideas that come your way. Um, do you use enthusiasm as a guide to what you choose to work on or other things that, that you um, point to? No, absolutely. Um, enthusiasm is, and by enthusiasm, I mean, how does it make me feel in that moment? Right. In the moment. And you maybe have heard this. Yeah. It's either a hell yes or a no. Okay. And if it's not a hell yes, if it's a, Hmm, I need to think about this. Okay. Right. That's a, and, and, and that is, you know, hell, the, yeah. hell yes or no. And if it's not a hell yes, like, and for me, the hell yes, it has to check a lot of boxes. It's not just money it's you know maybe it's brand location humans who, what, what are the human beings that i'm going to be interacting with on a regular basis do they have something that i can learn from and be inspired by of course we can all be inspired by anybody and learn from anyone but are they on my list of someone i was really excited to work with um whatever the rubric is for you to be able to say yes it makes it this goes back to a core value statement like what are you about why are you in this right. is it about paying rent then if it's about that then i think you should check yourself if it's about paying rent then to me you're not living the highest version of yourself now you can be in a profession that you would love more than anything and still need to pay rent but notice they're different right? Subtle, but real. And that distinction is up to you to identify. So if things are in line with your core values, and if they make your heart sing, if there is enthusiasm, genuine, heartfelt, earnest enthusiasm, that is what is important to at least set your sights on. Now, the goal of paying rent with your passion is very real. And so I don't want to pretend that there's not a discussion. Remember the, earlier in the book, the big three, um, you know, the, the, the people, um, money and creative control, those things are all going to come up over and over. So I think you should think about those things before you're confronted with those decisions. Um, but, you know, if my world is, uh, I do get to choose those things, then um, the cool thing is that that world is available to you as well. It's not, it doesn't matter how far along on the spectrum you are. I just want to make sure you're being honest with yourself that you're not setting some bar that allows you to say no to things that you should otherwise say yes to develop as a creator or as an entrepreneur or however you define yourself. So um, this is an area where a lot of people stumble and they stumble naturally because there's a, like everything else in this, in this course is a muscle and very few of these things are um, natural we are undoing a lifetime of programming of people who told us what was possible with this one precious life. And that's hard. I want to grant it, but it, it just that it is doable is exemplified in the people that you look up to respect, admire, appreciate, want to be like emulate inspired by all those things. They are living proof that it is possible. You also have moments in your life that when you look back, you felt connected, you felt in a flow state, you were doing things that you wanted with people that you like. Even if it was just for a day, a week, a month, a season, a project, it exists. Look at what it looked like. What were the takeaways that you have from that? How can you replicate that and set some core values around that as a North Star? Because as soon as you have a North Star, as soon as you have a why, making all these other decisions is so much easier. All right. I'm very sad that I have to say goodbye to you all. I'm very sad that this is the last uh, week, the last lesson, uh, session, if you will, in the creative calling book club. Um, I, I do want to ask for your ongoing support sharing, you know, you all sharing the answers, the, you know, pictures of you reading the book, uh, reviews on Amazon. It really does 
none of this happens without a community. And it has been a huge part of my individual success, the success of Creative Live. And the cool thing is, is this is what will create success for you all as well. If you're out there doing the work, we are now that we've read the book, we are absolutely crystal clear that the role that community plays in, we're absolutely clear that showing up for others, being the fan you wish you had, um, is such an important part of the process. I want to thank you all for showing up. I get tons of juice from this. And um, there are so many comments in the chat that uh, there's a lot of, if you haven't reviewed that yet and you're in the Zoom call, you should. Um, the hashtag creative calling is always available to you. I look at it every single day. If you want to put your work there um, on Instagram or whatever, I share a lot of the stories and the work that I see in the world um, in my stories. Um, I want to finish with a... See, let me look, check out my thing here. Um, I want to finish with a closing read. Not everything will be a fit for you. That's okay. Just as I assembled my own approach to life by deconstructing the lives of the creators, the skate punks, world-class performers, and philosophers I've studied, I encourage you to take what works, to integrate it into your own life, and to ditch the rest. If you're simply willing to accept that you are a creator, responsible for designing and living your own dream, I will consider my job here done. As your creative practice deepens and expands, you will experience a greater sense of direction over your own life. You will prove to yourself over and over that you have the power to turn your ideas into reality. This sense of agency and autonomy will bring you happiness and satisfaction like nothing else. Please pursue your own creative calling. All right, that was from page 290. I am so grateful for this community. I hope you've got a lot of value. Leave a review on the creative calling on this on the on the uh, on the book, if you would, on the website. Just participate in the community and show up. I, I see your names out there and know that I am noticing all of you. I'm seeing you. I am looking at your work, and Creative Live is here to support you in whatever we can. I hope you have an amazing day, week, weekend, and. I truly am working on trying to do more of this in a sustainable way. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, I'll reach out to you in any of the number of ways that I can. And shout out for everybody who volunteered their own personal story across this class. It was really helpful because if you have a question, so do thousands of other people. So raise a roof, shout it out. Now it's time to do a little dance as we leave. And I fade into the rest of my Saturday. I hope you all have an amazing weekend. Thank you.